So to study fiscal policy, optimal fiscal policy, we're going to um, follow the same approach as to study optimal monetary policy. We're going to specify uh, a generic framework, and then we're going to derive a sufficient statistics formula for the um, optimal uh, fiscal policy. That is, it's going to be a formula that's valid for any model that falls uh, into our general framework that we're going to introduce. Um, and, um, and furthermore, the formula will be expressed with, um, so with statistics that we can estimate uh, measuring the data. Okay? So it's a formula that applies to a broad range of models within the class that we're going to study. Um, and express in terms of, uh, of statistics that we have a hope of, of estimating in the data. So it's something that uh, is practical to implement um, in the real life. So what's the class of models that we're going to study here? Um, so we're going to study divine uh, beverage Samuelson's uh, models. Um, so you, when we studied monetary policy, we studied um, divine beverage Wigzel uh, model. So and here we are going to study divine beverage Samuelson model. So the key difference is that in the Wigzel models, we you know we assume that the interest rate could control aggregate demand, and we studied what's going on here. Here, because we're in a world in which um, interest rates are either fixed or out of control for the government, we don't really look at it. Um, on the other hand, we are going to introduce a government that provides public goods to the households, and the way we think about the role of the government. Uh, is based on Samuelson's work, and that's why you know this is a divine uh, beverage Samuelson model. Uh, the other elements will be really the same as when we studied monetary policy. The difference that we're focusing on a different policy here instead of interest rates, we're going to look at uh, public good provision. Uh, so what are the assumptions we're going um, to make? And any model that falls within that uh, broad class of model, the formula is going to apply. Uh, the formula is going to apply there. Um, All right, so what are the assumptions that uh, we're going to make that characterize this divine beverage Samuelson framework? So, you know, the beginning we can go quickly because we've already seen it with monetary policy. So first we'll have giving coincidence. And so this is just going to say that we are not going to uh, pay attention to inflation at all here. Uh, and so that can be you know, it can be for two reasons. Either we can think of it that, uh, you know, I think the, the easiest way to, to think about it is that um, inflation is exogenous. And does not respond Um, to aggregate activity. And so, of course, in a world like this, you know, um, what the government does, the amount of public spending that the government does has no effect on inflation. So, you know, it's not going to come up um, in the welfare analysis. Another thing that, uh, that would be possible is that when uh, aggregate activity is efficient, so when the unemployment rate is at its efficient level, then if you have, you know, if the divine coincidence uh, holds, uh, then we know that inflation will also be on target. And therefore, you know, <clears throat> inflation and unemployment, um, the efficient level for both of them is at the same point. And therefore, you know, in that case, you don't really have a trade-off between inflation and unemployment because, you know, if you're able to bring your economy to the uh, the unemployment rate to the efficient levels, and inflation will also be on target. So here's the two, you know, the two problems are completely aligned. Um, and in a world like this, uh, in a world like this, and the analysis would also go through because really there is no difficult trade-off for the government to solve. Uh, inflation is on target when. Uh, Unemployment is efficient. That is when u is equal to u star. 
So this is just uh, so this is just saying that we are not going to worry in the welfare analysis. We are not going to worry about inflation. Okay, so that's the first assumption that we are going to make. Second assumption, so you know, this is a divine part of the framework. Then we say it's a divine beverage model. So we're going to assume that there is a beverage curve, as we did before. Uh, <clears throat> and that's, um, so the beverage curve, you know, it relates the vacancy rate to the unemployment rate. Uh, and the reason why we do this uh, is because we want to have unemployment in the model. You know, or, you know, capturing like slack more generally. You have unemployment in the model, uh, and furthermore, in a beverage framework, we know we've already studied what is the efficient unemployment rate. We have sufficient statistics formula to compute it, um, and so you know, so we, and we have so therefore we're able to compute the unemployment gap very easily. So in a world like this, we know like how far. We are from efficiency. How far aggregate activity is from uh, from efficiency? How far we are from productive efficiency? Uh, we have a sufficient statistics, sufficient statistic formula for U star, uh, the efficient. unemployment rate, uh, which means that we can easily compute U minus U stars the unemployment gap, which would be important. Um, and in particular, um, here to simplify, we're going to um, we're, we're going to look at, you know, if that's required, we know, for instance, that uh, under uh, some kind of simplifying but realistic assumption, we know that we can have U star is equal to square root of U, so we might use that uh, in beverage and framework, but you know you don't you, you can have more general framework where you start is given by the, a more general formula as we had discussed. So this is the beverage uh, part of the model. So we have a beverage curve which gives us unemployment and furthermore allows us to compute the unemployment gap with sufficient statistics. We have a divine model, so we do not worry about inflation. And then the last part, uh, the last part is that we is the Samuelson part of the framework. And this is named after uh, Samuelson 1954, which is a very famous paper on um, the provision of public good. So Samuelson 1954, theory of public goods. So this is uh, really capturing how we're going to think about uh, government spending in the model. So the way we think about it, that the government uh, provides G public goods. And so the idea is that, you know, here we have a you know, we have a bunch of workers in the economy and workers are employed, but either workers can be employed directly by households and they provide uh, private goods. So say like households hire their own butlers and they provide services to them. Or the government hires some of the workers. So basically they are butlers that are employed by the government. And then to provide a good that will benefit uh, everybody, so a public good. Um, so, so for instance, you can think of it as uh, the government's gonna employ some uh, butlers, and these guys will say like be uh, teachers, and you know they'll teach everybody who wants to attend the courses uh, offered by the government, or the government will employ some uh, butlers who are good at landscaping, and these guys will go and landscape and take care of landscaping and parks um, in the economy, and that's something that everybody will benefit from. So the government hires some workers and these guys produce goods that are public goods. Therefore, they, they benefit everybody. So the government provides you public good. That's, of course, by, uh, I should say, employing uh, 
uh, some workers and you know uh, of course the government is going to recruit the workers exactly like the household in the same way that households have to post vacancies to find their butlers the government is going to also have to post vacancy as they do in practice and you know they'll have to expand uh, recruiting resources to find the right people exactly as they do in practice so the recruiting and everything works exactly the same but the difference is that the goods that are uh, you know the services that are uh, produced by these workers that are employed by the government they you know they are going to benefit everybody and they are you know formally they are going to enter the, the utility function of everybody they are public goods uh, so government provided by employed workers and recruiting, you know, recruiting them. Uh, these public goods they benefit uh, everybody. So that's what a public good is. Um, so formally, it means they are going to enter um, households. utility function uh, and so here already you see that this is very much the public finance uh, tradition that you have public goods and households benefit from them but here you can see already that we are departing from um, kind of typical macro approach so in, in macro it's quite typical to actually look down in a sense on government spending it's quite typical you know to have models in which government spending as i say is thrown into the ocean so is not valued uh, by people, which already kind of give you the slant a bit of this model that yes, indeed, if what the government produces is totally useless and has no value, yeah, you don't want to have a government. But of course, in practice, that's not what it is. Uh, a lot of public goods that are you know, provided by the government are very valuable. I mean, without the government, you have no roads, you have no railroads, uh, you have no public school, you have no public health system, uh, you know, you have no you know, like law enforcement, you have no justice system, you have no government statistics, you have nothing really. Uh, you know, so um, it's really silly to think that what the government uh, provides has no value at all. Um, so obviously what the government does uh, has value. And so here's that's what we recognize the government produces public goods and these are valued by households. Now, I'm not saying that public goods are perfectly substitutable for private goods. We'll see that both are just different arguments in the utility function, and there'll be an elasticity of substitution between public and private goods. Um, but nevertheless, uh, public goods are valuable. It's not like they are totally wasteful. Um, and so they'll enter the welfare calculation here. Um, and this, these public goods are, are provided by the government. Now, of course, there, there is, you know, there is a resource cost to this, you know, that's like really at the center of Samuelson's analysis. There is a resource cost to providing public goods because, of course, if the government employs workers to provide public goods, these workers cannot be employed by the private sector. So you will have a trade-off. You know, there is a finite number of workers that it's the size of the labor force, and you can allocate them either to provision of private good or provision of public good. And you know, they you know, they cannot do both at once. So that will be the cost of providing public goods is that you're moving workers away from the provision of private goods. And so, you know, there'll be, uh, there'll be an interesting trade-off here. Uh, so public workers, the key thing is that public workers do not uh, work in the private sector, of course. So here there'll be a resource constraint that you have to decide you know, once we study the um, social plan of problem, you have to decide how you allocate workers between um, the public and the private sector. So sure, the government could employ everybody, but then the problem is that there'll be nobody left to provide private goods. And so that, you know, that, wouldn't, be, uh, that wouldn't be optimal. Um, so that would be our setup. Um, so we'll have this, uh, we'll have this um, public goods uh, that enters utility and that you can also use, you know, by the government can hire more or less people to stabilize the economy. You'll have some unemployment um, and we are not going to worry about inflation. So that's, uh, that's the setup here.